All right, welcome to The Sherman Show. We are here live from New York City. I'm Jeff Sherman with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a special guest. We are broadcasting live uh, from the, uh, what is it, the U.S. Trust, former U.S. Trust Private Wealth Management Building. And we have none other than the CIO of Wealth Management, Chris Heisey. How are you doing, Jeff? Good. Good, Good to, to see you, Sam. You. Yep. Hey, uh, thanks for hosting us today and letting us come to your offices and film this. So in addition to the audio recording today, we have this video recording so you can see us live on YouTube as well at uh, youtube.com backslash double line capital. So uh, if you want to see what Chris looks like in, <laughs> live in person, uh, you can go there and see us as well. All three of you. Yeah. Well, we're trying to focus on you, uh, <laughs> not not us today. So, uh, Chris, um, you are the CIO here on the Wealth Management Arm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got here? And um, uh, we'll get deeper into kind of your day-to-day -day responsibilities. Well, sure. Just like everybody else, I, I think um, growing up, you, you had this one particular vision of what you wanted to do. Um, for most of us, it doesn't turn out that way. For me, it was, uh, was going to be all about baseball. So heading into college, I you know, had this dream of playing baseball after college. And in college, it only happened really for about oh, eight weeks or so. Okay. Uh, before getting cut uh, freshman year, and then you had to get serious. So I went to Villanova, uh, Villanova out in, um, outside of Philly, uh, still bleed blue uh, through and through, and um, I had a finance degree, business degree coming out of Villanova, and didn't really know what I wanted to do. And uh, fortunate enough that, um, thanks to my dad, back in those days, you, you know, you place a phone call, you get an interview, and you basically can't screw it up. So. From my perspective, uh, there was something called international trading. I had no idea what that meant, and they didn't really teach you about the markets uh, back in the uh, late 80s, early 1990s. So I started on an uh, international equity trading desk, did that for six, month, six months, and basically just a piece of paper would get passed to you. You look at the price, you ask someone, does this look good to you? Yes, you stamp it and you move it on. Um, so you didn't really use your brain too much, um, but you learned a lot about the fast-paced activity of the markets. So I took that uh, job, opened up in research, went up into research uh, at Merrill, and um, really learned from some of the best people on the street. And uh, you really got an incredible education day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, about how markets work, individual equities, um, how to analyze individual equities. And then I went into the portfolio group and then uh, Director of Policy for the International Wealth uh, Division, and then took a two-year, almost a two-year hiatus in the early 2000s, so around 2004, when came the CIO of Latin America for the Citigroup Private Bank, came to uh, U.S. Trust at the time in 2005 as the strategist, uh, and then when the bank bought us, uh, Bank of America bought us uh, in, at the time, uh, late 2006, uh, mid-2007, um, ultimately became Chief Investment Officer in September of 2007 for, at the time, U.S. Trust. And to make a long story short, we merged all of the Chief Investment Offices together, the Merrill, uh, the Bank of America Private Bank, in July of 2015. So presently, I'm the Chief Investment Officer for the Wealth Management Businesses of Bank of America, which includes Merrill and the Bank of America Private Bank. All right, so <clears throat> that's a great, I mean, you've done a lot already in your career, but let's go, let's rewind the clock there. Baseball, okay, yeah. you know I'm a baseball fan. Yes. So what position did you play? I uh, played shortstop in, in high school. Okay. Um, when I went to school, um, at the time, the Big East was a powerhouse mm -hmm. in, in, in baseball uh, between a number of the different colleges and universities. Uh, so I decided to move over to third base, unbeknownst to me, that um, we had an All-American there uh, okay. at school at the time. So it really didn't work out. Um, you know, my family says, fortunately uh, for all of us, it, it didn't work out. But um, I'm really thankful about what sports really teaches you, which is the competitive nature and the constant learning activities. And I think baseball, football, and basketball are three sports that force you to learn every second that you're either on the field, on the court, uh, or even in the dugout. Yeah, well, I mean, third base is a lot different than shortstop, that quick reaction time, yeah. you know, um, less range you have to do, but yeah. man, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta react quick hands and, right. and usually pretty good arm too, I That's assume, right. especially throwing deep in the hole from shortstop. Exactly. Right? Okay, so captain of the infield, outside the catcher, of course, who runs the whole team. That was <laughs> my right. position, so I'm still Excellent. biased there. But all right, so let's, let's, let's talk about, you know, the CIO for the bank, the private bank. What, what does that mean what, to our listeners who maybe don't know the difference between the bank and the private bank? What mm -hmm. is the difference there? What, wouldn't you talk about a private bank and you know, kind of what would be your responsibility for being the CIO there? 
Yeah, it's, um, it's a question, believe it or not, that we have to answer almost weekly because when you think about CIO in today's world, mm -hmm. a lot of people still think, and, and it's rightfully so, it's chief information officer. That's right. So you, you would be, from, you'd be shocked how many emails I get that's right. about technology jobs. And it's like, did you even read it? It's not but, that I use the acronym either, right? right? And so there, it's a funny thing that people think it is information because that's the prevalence of the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the technological aspects of the questions you get. And the next thing you know, you say, well, wait a minute. They actually think I'm the chief information officer. Right. And that's definitely not the case. But uh, CIO, from an investment perspective, it's really about the management of the investment process. Uh, the investment process for us going way back almost a couple of decades now, is all about the input, the throughput, and the output, to put it simply. The input, generally speaking, is a, a research capacity, research inputs, mostly around markets, uh, currencies, different asset classes, investment strategy, et cetera. And you have to have a pulse on things that are going on around the world, obviously more and more nowadays geopolitically, uh, but just from the standpoint of what is driving the market. So that's kind of the input management of that, production of that, development of that, and we have an investment strategy committee and a number of different well-trained strategists that help us produce that, um, all within the private bank as well as within Merrill. And then you transfer over to the throughput side of the business, that's more portfolio strategy, due diligence on individual solutions, portfolio construction. We firmly believe in goals-based asset allocation as well as wealth structuring, so all of that's in the middle, and then the output tends to be the portfolio itself and managing the actual portfolio centrally for a number of different investors, a number of different consumers, whether it's the consumer side of the business, the wealth side of the business, or the institutional side of the business. So, so you mentioned the phrase goals-based yeah. asset allocation. What does that mean, and, and what are you trying to achieve with that goals-based approach? I'm a big believer, we are big believers in an action is secondary to the plan. So before you can execute and before you can develop, it's just like a house, you have to have a blueprint. If you don't have a blueprint, um, generally speaking, something can go wrong more often than not. So from the standpoint of a goal, goals base is about what are you trying to achieve? And there's obviously many answers to that. Some are trying to retire, some are trying to create enough wealth to buy that third or fourth home. Others are, are trying to send their kids to college. Um, others are still just trying to protect what they've built. So you have a goal and then you build the portfolio amongst all different asset classes and then you do due diligence on individual solutions to put the right puzzle together to consistently meet those goals and objectives. Now we, our philosophy is a very small line that says be occasionally good, don't be be consistently good. Don't be <laughs> occasionally great. Okay. okay. And from that perspective, uh, that lends itself to making sure you take away the biggest uh, problem in our business, which is if you go through a fat left tail environment and you are a big portion of that left tail, you've really wiped away years. Explain, of explain what that phrase means, a big yeah. left tail. I, I assume you're talking about a distribution, probably distribution, which may be beyond the scope of our investors here, our yes. listeners here. So, so in, in simple terms, it's yeah. uh, uh, the big downfall, yeah. the big uh, left side of the equation, uh, left side of zero, which is a, a big negative event, um, whether it's a full year or a few, full few years. And obviously everybody goes back to 2008, early 2009, but we've had some, some sizable left tails or big negative events Fourth recently. Quarter of, Fourth quarter of 2018. Quarter of 2018, right. exactly. And we are constantly reminded every few months that that can happen um, as evidenced by what we were going through in August. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, things to, to, ways to think about it, but I think the best way is, is diversification is an overused phrase. It shouldn't be something that's overused in practice. There's no such thing as overused diversification, in, in our opinion. Well, when you, when you say that, too, I think it's, it's, it's interesting because when uh, we meet with clients and we do portfolio reviews, whether institutional clients or just um, people having reviews on you know, mutual fund investing or whatever it may be, uh, they always ask, well, what about this security or what about this sector of the market? Why did you own that? It's down. And you know, we like to we like to always remind people that if everything's up, you have probably not diversified. <laughs> Just like when everything's right. down, you're probably not diversified, right. right? So the goal is to have things that help offset one another, and that's part of the plan, right? No question about it. And and you point to a good point, Jeff, which is, hey, why why do we own this that's down? And and to your point, diversification, and oftentimes. Why do we own that? And it, you look at the portfolio position, sometimes it's 
0.25%. And the focus goes to the red. Yes. And, and, and oftentimes you, you, you get out of the whole essence of what we're trying to do, which is keep consistent returns mm -hmm. versus having everything go up. Uh, at the same time. So you're absolutely right. And I think we've all had those client reviews where they focus on that one, it's very myopic, it's that one line item or that one little piece and it, it's a marginal contribution to the overall portfolio. Right. That's right. And your whole portfolio can be successful, you're achieving your objectives, and all of a sudden you spend 30 minutes focused on this one area that really, even if it was up 200%, wouldn't impact the portfolio, <laughs> that's, right? That's right, portfolio contribution is, is uh, something we don't spend enough time on. And, and what, what, what is the reason for that in a portfolio? Emerging markets is probably a great example for mm -hmm. last year. Yeah. You know, why do I own emerging markets? And uh, obviously 2017, uh, that question didn't come up no. because mm -hmm. of the sizable outperformance. Right. Well, you talked about a plan. I, I think about, I'm going to bring it back to baseball again since you yeah. started me off on something interesting this morning here. Um, you know, when you're playing third base, for instance, right? Um, the plan is practice, practice, practice. But when it's game time, you just react, right? It's right. the muscle memory. It's right. just being able to, to perform. Uh, how do you view that as a metaphor for investing here too, mm -hmm. right? Because there's no practice when it comes to investing, right? right? There's only the results. So how, how does one get acclimated and getting comfortable with these asset allocations? I think you have to start with discipline, right? You have your core discipline. So even though each game, each pitch, each inning, you have to react, um, going into the game, you have a game plan. Mm -hmm. um, specifically, if you're up at the plate, you know what the pitcher is likely to throw you 0-2, you know what the pitcher is likely to throw you 2-0, and, um, and you don't want to get caught in a situation where you're guessing too often than not. And that is especially true in investing. So from the standpoint of reacting, it's important to react with significant research and study behind you versus reacting without data, without analysis, et cetera. And from my perspective, I think a, a, a good point would be the fourth quarter of 2018, uh, and specifically December. We had wild swings in the market. The volatility index, or volatility in general, was um, rising pretty substantially. And there was a lot of questions about the economy, whether or not we were going to go into recession. and. There was a lot of questions as to you know, what should we own if we go into recessions. And you get a lot of investors and clients, et cetera, ask you, should I swing from ultra cyclicals, mm -hmm. um, lower yielding high momentum companies or investments or managers to all the way to the other side of the equation, the defensive side. And human emotion takes over, behaviors take over, and your initial reaction is, as an investor is to, I want to protect because I see what's going on. The reality that's is- That's ex post, that's typically that's after it's already happened, right? Exactly, and we all are patterned to remember when. So when you're going through an event, it feels like exactly what was the worst event that you most recall. So from our perspective, it's to protect against significant movements in the portfolio and to not to overreact. Um, Put it back to baseball, you know a fast runner is going. Um, it's a small hit to third base. You're running, you're charging it. You have an opportunity to settle in with two hands and fire it, or you get it on the run. You, that's barehanded. reacting, yeah, barehanded. Right. Right. You, that's reacting to knowing the runner, but you know the runner. Uh, you would react differently if it was, say, a larger catcher. You say it was me running, I'm not very quick, so you can say <laughs> so, it, it's fine. Yeah. You know, from that standpoint, I think it's important to understand, have your discipline, do your research, and then you can react in a much better state. Yeah, I still, I don't think in my life I've ran a 40-yard dash <laughs> under five seconds still, so uh, that, that's how I got put back there too, is there was, there was no hope for me. Um, so you talk about this discipline and this approach, and you know, I, I would assume that it's not just empirical, but it's theoretical coupled with empirical data. So how do you respond to clients when they panic in the fourth quarter. And I, I remember December, I, I felt it was just three big self-inflicted wounds. First, Tariff Man, right? right? That's what the president called himself mm -hmm. and really rattled the market. Second, the Fed, 
Mm -hmm. um, Powell said that you know quantitative tightening is not a problem. Right. We're going to continue to hike. I think we all say that that's probably a mistake with with the, the 2020 of hindsight. Mm -hmm. um, and third, Mnuchin coming out and saying, "Don't worry about it." I talked to all the all the banks, the, all the CEOs of the banks this weekend. They're all solvent. And then we had the you know Great kind point. of yeah the the big move on Christmas Eve. But how do you try to keep people with that plan um, and say, like, look, this is a um, it's an intertemporal event. It's going to just, you know, it's going to be OK. This is why we have diversification, why I have all these positions. Mm -hmm. How do you continue to reinforce that when it feels like the market goes down every day or the investor feels like they're eroding all of their wealth all of a sudden? It's, it's difficult, uh, especially for new investors, uh, particularly if you're talking about operators, business operators, business owners uh, over the years that really were focused for a few decades um, on their business and they're great operators and they've accumulated substantial wealth. That's on the high net worth side. Well, and they usually do so by not being diversified, right? So that's, that's right. a whole different thing. They know that business very well. They have everything invested in that kind of one sector or one just business line. Right? Absolutely, Jeff. And, and they know that they took significant risks to build their business. Um, I often point to you took significant risks because you were well trained in that area. Mm -hmm. You knew that area. Um, and in, in many cases, that self reinforces why you took the risk. Um, having said all that, that's in the private markets as well. Mm -hmm. So the public markets are a little bit different. It's mark to market, real time pricing, et cetera. It's reacting to all the news and events, and even more so today uh, social media, you name it. So having that conversation with a client and going all the way back again to the goal, to the plan, and then going back at other events in history and showing them empirical evidence and facts as to how diversification works through very difficult times, whether it's tragic events that we've all lived through, the emerging market currency crisis throughout all the 1990s, almost every year, uh, 91 all the way through 99, the dot-com bubble, obviously, the accounting situations in 2000 to 2002, and then obviously the real estate and the credit crisis. And most recently, like you said, in the fourth quarter of 18. And each time, it's not easy when you're going through it, but when you come out on the other side and you're well diversified, you have a plan. And actually when things look, in many cases, the worst or the ugliest, if you believe in the fundamentals and you do real strategic research, then you should be adding when things look the worst and adding in areas that balance out the portfolio. So, but it's it's not easy. It's not easy. Now, I think what I think it's interesting there real quick before I let Sam jump in is that you described these different events in the 90s. Then you, um, you talked about the, the dot-com. A lot of people don't talk about the accounting scandals. I, I, that's something I think a lot of people forget about. They just still call it the, the dot-com area. But right. that's one, that wasn't what it was. But each of those events you described, they're idiosyncratic, right. right? There's not this big thematic thing that continues to continues to happen. Mm -hmm. So how do you use history as a guide here when you know we're talking about exogenous events or things that we haven't seen? Mm -hmm. You know, we always talk about investors fighting the last war, right? People hate hate mortgage-backed securities today because oh, they were the root of the crisis. But right. there was a lot of reasons they were the root of the crisis. So how do you prepare for that next exogenous event when by definition you don't know what it is? You know, it's uh, another good question. I, I think uh, general belief is that you need enough growth in the economy now to get technical nominal GDP. Yep. For those um, who are not well versed in what nominal GDP is, just think of cash flows in the economy um, without inflation. You need enough growth in cash flows in the economy, generally speaking, a healthy, strong consumer, generally speaking, a healthy U.S. housing market, and generally speaking, good job growth where the comfort level in your job allows you to spend and it keeps the economy going. Don't uh, we have all three of those right now? We do. Yeah. Okay. We do. Yeah. So you, you, you're you grounded on that. If you have enough cash flows to pay the liabilities in the economy, that means equity, which is the difference between assets and liabilities, generally speaking, goes up. If you have that belief and it's consistent, when you have bolts out of the blue that are idiosyncratic, uh, that doesn't change your five-year, your three-year, or your 10-year outlook as to how the economy operates. So from my perspective, that's number one. Number two, um, they call it reflationary tendencies. Uh, that's a fancy term for the central bank, as you guys know, that help to reflate the economy. You could do it through asset prices. You could do it through making 
things more attractive than others by lowering interest rates, using central bank policy tools. We've all seen the different acronyms that have been created in the last uh, 11 years or so. Uh, but f to put it simply, um, keep an interest rate at a level that induces transactions of some sort. And that kickstarts uh, the economy uh, when it falls to either below trend or trend line growth. So these are all fancy ways to just say, keep the train on the tracks, moving forward, and these idiosyncratic events can take the train to a station and stall it for a while, but it's still heading on north uh, to where it needs to go. So focus on that. Difficult to do, but that's the education that people should uh, consistently go back to. Yeah, and it seems like you know, in, in our line of work on the investment management side, education is a large part of our business and communicating what we're trying to do and you know, the, the goals that we're trying to to, to achieve within the portfolios. Um, I know you spend a lot of time on the client side and, and you know, we've gone through in the last year to year and a half quite a bit of a roller coaster in markets. You know, we've been talking about fourth quarter 18 and then you, know, you think about what's happened year to date thus far. It's been you know, the, up, you know, the downs and you know, the backups. How are clients, you know, how are your clients thinking about this today? I mean, how, how's this investor sentiment out there? Yeah, they're still worried uh, pretty much across the board. You know, as evidenced by the flows that we're all seeing. Um, I, I personally believe our team has done a lot of work on this. Um, and first thing, the first thing we learn in this business is surround yourself by the best team. Uh, make sure you get great people. And that doesn't mean, uh, I don't mean the most intelligent people, uh, people who really work well together um, and ha bring a different skill set to the team. So we're fortunate enough to have that here. And what we've seen um, across the board is folks and investors, consumers, um, large business owners, they're not owning fixed income necessarily because they are afraid. That is true in some cases, but the overwhelming reason is uh, that we've seen is there's obviously this huge movement towards retirement. We know all the demographics. It's not just in the States, it's outside the United States, but also the U.S. tends to be the attractor of fixed income flows because of its um, attraction of yield versus the rest of the world. So that's one thing, that's one part. So you can't just look at flows. Um, you have to look at sentiment. There's a number of different sentiment readings out there. The biggest one that we look at is the uh, AAII, American Association of Institutional Investors Survey, which basically tells you that at one point in time, in August as well as in the fourth quarter, we were at the lowest levels we've seen in decades in, in that particular sentiment index. And that gives us a good feel for how much selling pressure you, you may get. Our view is very simple on, for between now and the end of the year. Two main catalysts, Jeff touched on them a little bit before, Federal Reserve policy and the tariff situation. We think the U.S.-China trade war is not only a very, very long strategic change, mm -hmm. um, it's also one in which it's very difficult to see quote unquote, a deal coming anytime soon or anytime soon after that. Uh, there could be something that looks like a deal. Uh, it could be more of a truce versus a deal. But once people begin to get comfortable with the five, 10 year outlook on where this is really going, which is more of a technology war mm -hmm. and more of a dominance of the supply chain, um, it appears that more and more companies will change their supply chain. So they'll get used to it. Now there's a J-curve effect, right? So we think we're going through a J-curve effect on CapEx, on manufacturing, on industrial activity. It seems to be bottoming in some cases. We need Europe to bottom um, and get going. We need some, a fiscal response in Europe because monetary policy, obviously with negative yields, <laughs> doesn't seem to be working. Um, and at the end of the day, the good old U.S. consumer is strong. The net income in the household is going up across most cohorts, including the lower income side of the equation. So we are, um, overused term here, um, reasonably constructive, cautiously optimistic, um, but I would say bullish as it relates to where we're headed uh, overall in the investment management um, framework, which is uh, we are overweight equities, we're underweight fixed income, but don't confuse that with don't own one or the other. It's a coordinated mix of the two. Yeah, so you talked about the, <clears throat> the August event and sentiment getting very negative, and you know, there's a lot of momentum in the bond market at that point in time, specifically in rates. 
And we saw that throughout the month of August. It, it seems like when everybody came back from the Labor Day holiday, um, that, that sentiment shifted a bit. But you focused on manufacturing there, yeah. and the manufacturing data globally looks very weak, right? Yeah. It's been weak for a, a prolonged much. period of time in Europe. Uh, we started to see the U.S. manufacturing start to dip into that contractionary. Don't right. go confuse contractionary. It was recessionary. Yeah. But um, it's very similar to what we saw roughly three and a half, four years ago, right, where we had it concentrated in the energy segment. Right. Um, what's different this time? And you talked about focusing on those three areas of the economy, right, the consumer, uh, housing market and job, jobs market. Um, we still see those three data points looking good, but we're seeing this contraction in the industrial side. How does that play into your thinking today? And is the market too focused on the industrial segment, specifically as it relates to the U.S.? Yeah. So I think um, the general market and people in the market, it's right to be focused on areas that um, tend to get weak and can pull down the overall level of growth, regardless of their overall percentage weight in, in the economy. So manufacturing is somewhere around single, uh, you know, 10 to 13 percent of the U.S. economy, much bigger in Germany, obviously, much bigger um, in China, for sure. And when you think about the trading partners around the world, um, and you think about what has pulled down manufacturing, it started really with auto production and auto manufacturing. Mm -hmm specifically out of Europe and specifically out of Germany uh, about two to three years ago. But we and had these problems too about five years ago as well and then there were some events that kind of changed that a little bit, right? No yeah. question yeah. about it. And that's what you have to figure out is what is the catalyst that actually changes um, from something that is contractionary that goes into recessionary like you talked about. And from our perspective, uh, that cloud is still pretty gray. Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be a fiscal adjustment. Uh, in Europe, uh, specifically within Germany. Difficult to do relative to what the U.S. can do on the fiscal side. It takes a little longer there, but it seems like they're moving towards that. Uh, overall, manufacturing, industrial activity, capital expenditures, I, I want to I separate those two for a second because CapEx or capital intensive or capital investment is something I think that's, uh, dare we say, mismeasured. Okay. If you think about it, companies that are in the streaming space. If they buy or develop content, let's just say it's seven, eight, ten billion dollars, is that counted as capital investment? Today it's not, but it's a capital investment to them. So as we get to a more asset light world, as more economies or become physical asset at least, right? Yes, yeah, physical right. asset light world. And, and things are more um, secured in the cloud and the next version of the cloud, and things become more R&D, research and development, and economies become more service-oriented in general, because the more people you have, the more you have to service, regardless if there's robots servicing them or not. Mm -hmm. We're gonna move into a world where the one dollar of capital investment goes a lot farther than ever before. So your leverage of your capital investment is much greater. So you might not need as much dollars. So from my perspective, think about that as not a bad thing, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So I think you're gonna see productivity actually start to pick up. And as productivity starts to pick up, that's where your growth bottoms out, and then you start to go back above trends. So it's a combination of two things, bottom out in manufacturing, keep the consumer uh, as the engine here. It's a dual track world, it's the US consumer in the West, uh, and it's still manufacturing industrial activity uh, in the East. Uh, we need that to bottom out and the U.S. consumer to just hang in there. And that's what job growth will tell us. So from our perspective, uh, we do feel good. And the catalyst is have clarity on trade, just clarity. People can manage around clarity. And then on the other side of the equation, uh, job growth in the U.S. Uh, should keep the consumer healthy. So in August, did we kind of hit peak uncertainty for the year? Um, because it seems like there was a confluence of those events. Now, obviously, you don't know what happens in the next three and a half months or so. But it seemed that we had really bearish sentiment everywhere. There was a lot of negativity. There was a lot of uncertainty. It really started around August 1st when the president announced the next round of tariffs on the last bulk of goods, which... Ultimately, we feel at least we'll hit the consumer much more mm -hmm. measurably than the first two rounds that we've right. seen. Um, and so is that just the market digesting that? Um, and we got a little over, we overreacted as, as a whole, or is it just one of those just kind of, <laughs> I'll, I'll use the phrase from, from the Fed chairman, a mid-cycle adjustment? Well, I think what, what we've learned um, 
in our business, uh, in any business, uh, in today's day and age, I think words mean a lot. Mm -hmm. And if you go back uh, to, what is it, seven years ago now, um, Mario Draghi, the head of the European <laughs> Central Bank, said whatever it takes. Yep. Didn't change, a, a, didn't use a tool. Yeah. For years. Didn't do didn't anything do, yeah. for years. Yeah. Yeah. Said three words. Yeah. You go back to January, and uh, our Fed chair, Chair Powell, said, we're listening to the markets. Mm -hmm. Didn't use a tool. That really solidified It was like January things. 4 or something. January yeah, that Friday, 4. Yeah, right. That's right. So words mean a lot. So when, when, when real well-trained economists, uh, investment managers say uh, that monetary policy is, is impotent and, in, and we're pushing on a string, I disagree completely. There's so many different tools that one can use as a policymaker, policy setting committee, to help reflate things. The first tool is words. Mm -hmm. And we'll know more about that um, upcoming. Yeah. A few hours. Uh, a few we're sitting hours. here on Fed Day in <laughs> yes. the middle of September, right? So I think choose the words correctly. Confidence, as we all know, in anything, baseball, yep. sports, music, uh, production of a play, uh, in our business, confidence is everything. And that's uh, what we need more of. So from your question, Jeff, um, in terms of have we seen a bottom in sentiment in, in August? I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, I think rates will tell us that, yeah. right? Rates yeah, I mean, it's a big, part, big, big reversal. We're, we're calling for that. It will be the bottom for the year. So um, hopefully we're right on that. That's right. Um, but it, it, does, it did feel like we overshot a bit. Uh, it's funny you mentioned confidence, too, because I, I remember, and I didn't go as far in baseball as you. I didn't make that eight-week uh, eight trial in, in uh, college. But... Um, it always felt like when you, you know, you're on a hitting streak or you're doing very well, you had that confidence stepping in the box right? as a hitter. You knew you could, you knew you could hit it. And like when you get in the slump, it's, it's just the opposite. And so I think it's interesting you say that, but do, do the central banks, you know, with this negative interest rate policy that the Bank of Japan has pursued for a couple of decades practically, um, that Mario Draghi has done through most of his tenure now as he hands off to Christian Lagarde, um, is that a problem for the overall system? Um, because there's confidence there, but it does seem that it is eroding confidence by having these negative yielding, supposedly safe assets. Yeah, and it's um, self-reinforcing in many perspectives because you, people scratch their head and say, how could one buy a negative yielding bond? I mean, we hit 17 trillion, I think, at its peak right. a couple of weeks ago, right. negative yielding bonds around the world, and some of that in, in actually corporate bonds, right. which is amazing. It was almost a trillion, a trillion one, I think, is what it peaked at at that same time. And in corporate, in corporate securities, you in know, corporate companies securities. are getting paid yeah. effectively. Right. It's not, that's not exactly the mechanic, but that's what it looks like, right? Yeah, and, and, in, and, and some high yielding, companies uh, also yeah. in, in the junk status. So when you, when you think about that, it's, it's a head scratcher and it's like, how can that be? Um, well, there's a lot of money that follows an index and you have to own what's in the index. And these are machines oftentimes, or it's a prescribed investment plan that has um, low tracking error, which is a way to say, I need to own most of the index. Right. So you have to buy the bonds and that creates a negative feedback loop in some cases, and obviously it works the other way too on the upside. But you've got that dynamic. Then you've got this significant search for yield, and yield because income is hard to find for a lot of folks. And as you retire, you want to replace the paycheck you had, so you look for a particular income, so you search for yield. Um, and that often means you have to go more into fixed income. And then you wake up after a couple years and you see that you're yield to maturity on your overall portfolio is now at about 2%. What do you do? In many respects, you go to equity land and you look for securities that are yielding above that, but you're apprehensive to do that because that means taking more risk. So we're caught in this investment framework that's like that. And then on the central bank side, uh, because it's difficult to kickstart good inflation, to keep the level of prices up at a level that induces the cash flows to pay down the liabilities, uh, central bankers are, are not caught between a rock and a hard place, but they're actually caught in a chair uh, that they're strapped to. And now the question is, is who's going to undo the straps? Mm -hmm. And the, the fiscal policy. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's important because I heard that from uh, Chairman Powell at the July meeting, um, or I think it was his testimony at the beginning of July, his testimony to Congress. He was saying that monetary can't work 
on an absolute on its own, mm -hmm. right? He was trying to induce some sort of fiscal, although we have been stimulating fiscally in this country, if you look at the budget deficits, right? right? Uh, for the first 11 months, we crossed a trillion dollars right. in terms of the deficit. Um, you hear that, I heard that from Mario Draghi last week, mm -hmm. right? He's, he's talking about Northern Europe needs to induce fiscal stimulus. Right. So is this um, finally, we're seeing, and I'm not saying finally, but is the messaging more now that you can't just rely on monetary policy? We've all known this in, in right. markets for many years, but it seemed that the focus post-crisis was what is monetary policy going to do? And it was kind of the masters of the universe, right? These right. few heads of these central banks around the world were the ones driving everything. And now they're saying, look, we've taken this as far as we can really go, right? right? It's up to you politicians to actually deliver us something. Yes, and, and uh, like anything else, um, People, businesses, investors are getting used to the current monetary policy regimes around the world, which is a fancy way to say ultra low interest rates. And from my perspective, I'm, I'm not um, as well versed on the bond side as you guys, but I would say when you get used to something, particularly low rates, any movement that is above that, you get a stall movement. Uh, in some cases, you, you quicken the pace of what you want to do. You're seeing it right now in refinancing. Mm -hmm. You know, mortgage rates backed up a little bit. There was a rush to get into that, thinking they're going to back up a little bit more. Housing starts up 12%, obviously multifamily driven mostly, yes. but big move. So f people get used to something that's been around for a long time. Yeah. So it's it's going to be very difficult to have something else and have it sustainable. But you, hold on real quick on that, because I, I was really focused on this last year. You know, as we were talking about rates going up, you know, we still think that we're going to go back to, you know, kind of the levels we saw last year. It's not going to happen overnight. It takes time. But it seems that it goes in pockets, right? That, you know, you have this, you know, 40 or 50 basis point kind of range you trade in, then you set a new center of gravity, right? right. And I think that's exactly right. When you talk to people, uh, say you're looking for a house, right? You look out there and you say, okay, my mortgage will be 4%. Right. Then all of a sudden rates move up. You say, oh, it's four and a half. I can't do that, right? right? So you sit on the sidelines for three, four, five months. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, four and a half is normal again. Right. And so it's this anchoring bias I think we do have just as, as human cool. beings, right? And I think that is very important. So, so. No, so just bringing it back to the fiscal side of things, you know, you were talking earlier about the importance and the productivity of forward-looking guidance from central bankers um, through monetary policy. You know, we, we saw some of the forward-looking guidance through fiscal policy as well back in 2016 around the election season when it seemed like both parties were talking about infrastructure spending. Mm -hmm. Now you know, we have uh, 2020 coming up and some of the forward-looking guidance is perhaps we'll see a payroll tax uh, cut coming in uh, sometime around you know, early 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of that do you think is going to be impactful from a U.S. consumer standpoint? Do you think people are going to start um, spending more and how much of it is going to impact the fiscal deficit side more importantly and does that scare you in terms of you know what Sherman was talking about too, a trillion uh, 11 months into the fiscal year? Yeah, I, I, uh, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting answers to that Sam. Uh, I, I, I would say let's go to the central tendency and is if if you're worried about a stronger dollar, if you're worried about another catalyst helping out the consumer, i.e. manufacturing and industrial activity picking back up above the 50 level, which would be expansionary, and, and if you don't have a confidence that that's going to happen, then your worry over where rates are and inflation and monetary policy skyrockets. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're at. So that's one thing. How does that affect the consumer? That We all know it could affect the consumer on their financing rates. But what is absolutely most important to a consumer is their confidence in their job. And one of the ways to assess that is to look at the not, not only claims, unemployment claims, but job growth. Where are the jobs? In what type of industries? In what states? Um, transfer that into something called the quit rate. If the quit rate goes up, people feel more comfortable about their job, that they can get another one or that they already have another one. Um, and we haven't seen any of those dynamics change for the worse. They've actually stayed pretty steady. So we feel very confident that the consumer should remain strong, um, but manufacturing and other areas are still struggling. And as, as Jeff said before, 
they're pulling down the general level of the economy to at least trend, 2% or so, somewhere around there. And you bounce around a little bit. So running a deficit in a 2% GDP type of dynamic uh, is okay, but you can't do it and keep widening it out. You need nominal GDP to be at a particular level, say 4%, 4.5%, 5% or better, to shrink that deficit um, and over time, what fiscal policy thinks about is go into deficit first and let growth take you out of it later. And it's still too early right. to but basically if, if, say, is that working? If you calculate those numbers today, we're running at a trillion. You call it a trillion. Let's be nice and call it a trillion one for the year. Uh, GDP is roughly, what, 22 trillion or right. so. So you have about a 4.5% deficit already. So that 4.5% nominal growth rate doesn't really get you anywhere, right? You're just kind of plugging that gap. And so we need that, as you call it, the J-curve effect. You need something that this investment needs to be able to be more stimulative for a longer period of time. I think that's the thing we found challenging is that since the crisis, I mean, the, the deficit, you know, the, just the overall budget deficit has increased by 2x almost what nominal GDP has done. And so do we ever get out of this cycle of just being able to, um, you know, just kind of tr chug along? I think that's why we're at trend line growth, right? Because that's, right. that's effectively what's happening still. And we need that next catalyst to really drive growth. We, we do. Um, and we need population growth. That would be that would be great, right? Population yeah. growth would take care of some of the ills of of, of debt and and running a deficit. Um, secondarily, I, I think you're going to need to see a substantive housing cycle. Mm -hmm. So where what do you it, mean by that? Well, it needs to to not have fits and starts. No pun intended. Yeah. It needs to have a consistent growth rate, um, and to it's already gotten off off the ground, and it is slow to re re-uptake uh, a new housing cycle since the last one. Um, as millennials get into their older years now, we're starting to see that the demographics are taking over and they're actually going into single family homes. Mm -hmm. So we've got another decade of that and then you've got Gen Z's behind them. So we feel very comfortable that a housing cycle in the U.S. can help get us above trend line growth, eat into the deficit a little bit, but you can't have the deficit go up further from here. That's the difficult part, right? Uh, last but not least, we, talk, we haven't talked about it yet, but the debt, the debt shelf. Another thing that we always get asked a lot by clients, my goodness, what about the debt shelf? What, you know, the entitlements, liabilities, how are we going to pay for this decades out? Uh, what are our grandchildren going to do uh, and their grandchildren? And we never dismiss it because it's probably the single biggest question we get and probably the single most concern. But if you really think about it, you cannot take an existing <coughs> funding source that's attached to an existing liability and reconfigure it to apply to a future liability and not hurt the existing liability right. that it's attached to. Right. So you have to find a new funding source and... You've heard some candidates uh, <laughs> you know, proposing new sources, yes? Yes, and one potential thing to think about uh, there's a lot of mechanics out there, but, but one potential thing to think about is what if we actually created some sort of a tax on ourselves in the export market of, say, liquefied natural gas or something that we have an abundance of that other countries need, tie that to an infrastructure uh, spending bill and tax ourselves on receipts that come back uh, on things that we send overseas, particularly things that we don't get money on today in bulk and then apply it to a national debt relief fund or something like that, and then over the next 60 years, pay it down. Um, you know, we've seen it before with, with uh, Mexico uh, in the 80s um, and, and the bill that was done there between the United States, and you take that kind of a microcosm, I'm not saying it's, it's the, the gas market, but take that framework and apply it to this rising debt shelf and, and potentially the concern starts to lessen. Yeah, um, sounds like you may have uh, another career down the no, road no, in no. politics, maybe? No, this yeah. is just yeah. being creative. Okay, okay, fine. Um, so before we jump to the last segment of the show, I, I want to ask one question specifically. How, how does one apply all these, these concepts we're talking about today? What are you advising clients? What do you like? Is there something that you're, you're uh, kind of advising to warn people about today? What's top of mind uh, in your discussions with clients? And, and importantly, what's an actionable item? 
Yeah, so we do um, our CIO office. Uh, there's about 300 uh, or so employees in the CIO office. We talked about this before that manages um, basically the investment process for a variety of different lines of business here. Uh, but at Bank of America, on the uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch side in the uh, research department, there's over 600 analysts uh, covering you know, thousands of securities, different markets, and very top rated, excellent organizations, a big partner of ours. So we do a lot of thematic work together. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is, is obviously the U.S. consumer, we've, we've talked a lot about that. But if you really think about what's driving economics and what's driving growth around the world, uh, it's about first and foremost innovation. And innovation today, the innovation cycle today, um, is a lot, I would say the spectrum and the horizon is a lot wider, even though in, in galaxy and physics terms, it can't possibly be. <laughs> but from our perspective, it is. Uh, and, and the reason is because in the 1990s, in the 80s, it was about the national defense system, NASA, really creating the technology and then applying it out to the consumer world. In the 90s, it was more about uh, building of the internet. Mm -hmm. In the 2000s, it was about using the internet. Um, and the different components of that, whether it's switching, whether it's semis, et cetera. Now we're at a point where it's about the manipulation and the usage of data okay, yeah. and how to apply it uh, to run businesses, how to apply it to invest, how to apply it to shrink costs, how to apply it to um, uh, widen out margins, et cetera. And it's one of the reasons why we still see margins at an all-time wide right now in corporate America is because we're still early in the innovation cycle. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about 5G in tech land or 5G and what it's going to do to the healthcare costs. Think about digitalization uh, in the banking world, uh, digitization of anything, uh, sensory chips, Augmented reality, artificial intelligence, which I think we should change the name of. It has to be called official intelligence because artificial is not real, right? right. So Artificial uh, news. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just think we're at the, the, the footbed of an enormous innovation cycle that's going to carry us uh, over the course of decades. So when we talk about investing today, it's about owning various managers, um, whether it is a third-party manager, whether it's a separate account that we manage uh, in fixed income. It's not just owning fixed income. It's called fixed income for a reason. Think about that. Uh, what is its role in a portfolio? We put that all together in a mosaic based upon goals-based asset allocation, a defined plan that you want to achieve, and consistently apply your view to that. And if you go into a situation where we have to go underweight equities, um, we need to build that plan in a step-like function. It's not on a Wednesday you're overweight, on a Thursday you're going underweight. Mm -hmm. So um, have a well-thought-out plan. Uh, thematics, worldwide trends do matter. Uh, think about the next five, ten years, uh, but manage the portfolio today on the way to those five to ten years. Yeah, I think uh, that, that's a great summary too because ne never short human innovation, right? right. It always looks bleak to every generation. Right. There's always you know, some dire thoughts, but it seems that the, the innovation, that spirit, yeah. the passion, the entrepreneurial spirit, and I think that's, that's why the U.S. has one of the bigger you know, kind of financial markets in the world is this is the hotbed of innovation. So, no question. Um, okay. With that, uh, we thank you for your time. But uh, since we're here live in New York, uh, I got to introduce you to Sam's favorite part of the show. So Sam, kick us off. That favorite part of the show is the Sherman Says segment. Uh, so what I'm going to do, Chris, is I'm going to offer you a series of prompts, alternating between you and Sherman, actually, and uh, ask you to provide a top of mind response. Excellent. So we're going to kick it off with Mr. Sherman with Manufacturing U.S. Contracting. I don't think it's bottomed yet. Corporate leverage, U.S. A big concern at the top of mind, um, but ultimately uh, manageable. Global economy, X U.S. Stagnating. U.S. economy. The engine of the world. Fiscal stimulus. Necessary. Negative interest rate policy in the U.S. Here for quite a long period of time. Oh, in the United States. Uh, let's retract that. 
um, do not believe it is in the minds of anyone to see it happen. No, none of us want it. <laughs> yeah. Electric scooters. Winning. I live in the home of them, right? So they're everywhere. Yeah. I, was gonna, I would say yeah, dangerous. They're kind of, they're, they're uh, kind dangerous. of annoying. That was my word. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, once you're an adopter, uh, you, you may change your mind. Yeah. Tell that to Kimbrough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, universal basic income. Uh, looks to, uh, appears to work on paper, but probably not in reality. Favorite music genre? Hip hop. And the last one, favorite pizza? Can I go with a combination? Let's go. Okay. People might cringe at this, but the left side of the pizza has to be the left side. Okay. When, you, when you're looking at yeah. it. Salad, but on top of cheese and, and, and marinara sauce. The right side, mushroom, but the whole thing, hot oil. Never heard of that. Uh -huh. You know, I, I have a strange one. I, I like the Hawaiian pizza, yeah. you know, the, the ham and the pineapple, but with jalapenos. So you get that spicy okay. with the sweet, too. So it's yeah. a good combo there. So, um, But I'll have to try that one time. So maybe next time um, we'll, we'll do this over, over a pie and uh, we'll check it out. So Excellent. Chris, thanks for hosting us today. We really appreciate it. It's very insightful. I think we, our listeners gleam a lot from this especially as you talk about trying to shape the future of these wealthy clients out there that are just trying to either preserve or, or achieve their goals. I think this is applicable to really um, any investor out there. So we really appreciate the time today. Yeah, thanks. And I enjoyed it very much and uh, appreciate you guys taking the time. Okay. And so to wrap this up, uh, if you got any feedback, you can uh, email us, shermanshow at doubleline.com. You can see us on the Twitter. Uh, the Twitter is at Sherman Show Pod. Uh, these are on Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, iTunes, and about 40 other platforms. I have no idea what they're called. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being here, Chris. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank guys. You. Thanks, Appreciate Chris. It. All right.